So today it's my, my pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Richard Clayton. Uh, Richard comes to us from the Department of Computer Science at the University of Sheffield in the UK, and he's been part of uh, the University of Sheffield, I think, since 2003. Before that, yep. you were funded, uh, I think, mostly by the Br British Heart Foundation through yep. positions in a hospital and also the University of Leeds, if yep. I remember rightly. Um, and we've known Richard for quite some time. Uh, we've, we know as many people around here. He spent um, visits here, I think, in 2009 on sabbatical, and another short visit was a few years later, yeah. if I remember rightly. 2015. Um, oh, right, only two years ago. Yes, yeah. okay. So Richard's uh, uh, main area, of really, of, of expertise and, and interest is really around cardiac arrhythmias, I think. And he's uh, touched on different methods of looking at cardiac arrhythmias, so lots of really innovative modelling. Uh, he's looked at experimental techniques, measurement and analysis of cardiac arrhythmias. And today he's going to, I'm not sure really what he's going to talk about, it's certainly around cell models, but the rest of it's just a little uncertain. And he can quantify the Yes, thanks very much, Marty. Yeah, there, there is a, a, a lot, there are a lot of jokes you can make about uncertainty, but uh, I've got a reasonable idea uh, what I'm going to be saying uh, for the next um, 40, 50 minutes or so. Um, and the, the title really is, is Sensitivity and Uncertainty. And what I want to do to start with is just to scope out some of the, the background to why we might want to be interested in uh, sensitivity and uncertainty for, for, for physio modelling um, in general. Then I want to talk a little bit about Gaussian processes and what they are. And then I'll take you through some of our adventures with using uh, these tools to look at cardiac cell models. Um, so I'm based in a computer science department, so um, the first slide uh, will be familiar to most people, I guess. Um, and it just shows the, the relentless um, improvement in uh, computational power that has been going on um, ever since uh, computers or <coughs> mechanical computers were invented. Um, and for, for us, that's quite good news because it means that we can solve uh, bigger models to greater precision. Um, and uh, it means that for those of us who are interested in cardiac modelling, uh, we've gone from um, some of the work that was done uh, by, by Dennis Noble, but before him by Hodgkin and Huxley on mechanical computers for uh, solving the equations, uh, to more recent work uh, where computational models of the heart, of individual patient hearts, um, are being proposed as a tool for guiding therapy. Um, so this is uh, a paper published by the Johns Hopkins, Hopkins group with Natalia Trianova. Um, and uh, this is the only picture I could find on the internet of their computational facility. I mean, it's a shed, right, with a power supply and cooling. Um, so we've, we, we've, we've gone a long way um, and we can do a lot more. Where is that? Um, I can't remember. I d it's somewhere in the vicinity of, of Baltimore. but exactly where, I don't know. Um, but uh, but that's, the, that's the, the computational facility that they use for their, uh, for their computations. Uh, but it's, it's a kind of generic um, uh, compute resource, really, in a, in a shed. Um, the trouble is that uh, the models we're using are quite complex. And I guess some of you will have seen uh, this slide before. Um, it's a slide. Uh, or an image produced by Steve Niedra as part of his PhD thesis and also published um, in uh, Experimental Physiology. Uh, for those of you who have not seen uh, this uh, slide before, uh, each of the panels, um, A and B, sorry, I'm pointing at this, uh, this screen. For those of you over there, I hope you can translate, because uh, if I think if I try and point over there, I might injure somebody. Um, so. Uh, these are, uh, each, each block represents um, a model uh, of human ventricular myocytes. Uh, and the little uh, squares represent components of the model, so an ion channel, a pump, or an exchanger. Um, and the colored blobs um, are individual uh, parameters or features that uh, make up these different components. Um, and each of these is coded for the temperature at which the study that the parameter value is based on was done. Um, and some of these uh, parameters have been measured at room temperature or, or even, even colder, uh, 12 degrees C. Uh, and you probably <coughs> can't see it, but the letters indicate the species in which the experiments were done. And bearing in mind that these are human cell models, 
Uh, there's a diverse range of species, including uh, not defined, um, that have been used to build these models. Um, so although these models are stable <coughs> and they work, they produce an action potential quite nicely, um, we can't really be confident that the numbers, the parameters that go into the models, uh, are correct. So um, we're, we're not certain uh, about those. Um, the other uh, issue that arises when we look at experimental data is that um, action potentials are very variable. So this is a, uh, <coughs> just a, an example um, of action potentials recorded from different parts of the canine right atrium. Um, and there's a lot of different shapes there uh, from different cells. Um, and uh, as well as the variability between uh, <coughs> different cells and different parts uh, of the heart, um, there's also a lot of variability in anatomy. Um, so this is an example um, of uh, a left atrium, that left atrial anatomy. That might be uh, an anatomy that we would use uh, for simulations. Um, but if we look at different uh, patients, um, this is, uh, these are torsos and atrial geometries obtained from eight individuals um, in a study that was done at Karlsruhe in Germany. Um, and uh, there's, there's quite a lot of, whoops, quite a lot of variation uh, between the, the, the torso anatomies, which you can see, um, and also the atrial uh, anatomies. Um, so we've got uncertainty in whether our parameters are right. Um, we've also got variability um, between individuals. Um, and I don't have a slide to show it, but if we were to look at a cardiac cell that was beating, uh, beating away, there would also be some variability from one beat, one action potential to the next. So what are the issues? What's going on here? Um, well, I've tried to list some of the, the, uh, the, the concerns here. I, I suspect we're all aware that physiology is, a, is detailed, much more detailed than many uh, of these systems that we look at in standard uh, engineering. There's a lot of interacting parts. And a lot of these things are very difficult to measure um, and uh, may be difficult to measure precisely, or they may be impossible uh, to actually measure. And we've also got things that are changing. So um, ion channels are constantly being, um, being made by the cell and then uh, degraded. So the ion channel density is not, a, it's not a fixed number. It's something that is actually intrinsically variable. Now, one of the, the goals of physiome type modeling is to develop uh, predictive models that can be used um, in the clinic. Um, and these. Uh, three bullet points here are concerns for that um, because there's variability within and between individuals. So what can we do? Um, well, we need to face up to the fact, I think, that models are not the same uh, as reality. Um, they, they neither capture neither the, the full complexity nor all of the interactions that are going on. Um, and some of our model inputs um, and I'm going to be talking about inputs. Uh, when I'm talking about inputs, I mean parameters uh, of models. Um, model inputs may be uncertain. We may not be sure uh, what they are. Um, and some of, these, some of these parameters, some of these inputs are going to be changing. Um, so they're actually going to be, not going to be a fixed value, uh, even if we could measure them precisely. And if we're going to deploy models for uh, clinical decision support in the clinical setting, then ideally we'd like to embed some measure of confidence in a model, a model prediction, so a, a confidence interval um, or, or a, an estimate of variance or something like that. Um, and uh, with the variability, that is actually something that has been tackled um, in other, uh, other domains. Um, and what I'm going to talk about in the rest of the talk is um, uh, none of these techniques are new. Um, a lot of them have been, uh, or these techniques have been used in other, in other areas, and uh, I think there's a, a great opportunity for um, the, the physiome community to learn uh, from some of these experiences. So, um, models are not equal to reality. Um, I've, uh, I guess these slides might, I can make them available afterwards because they've got links in. Um, this is a report that was uh, produced um, for the National Research Council in the US um, on uh, reliability of complex models in a whole load of different domains, not just 
models of biology or physiology. Um, but one of the things that this report highlighted, and you can download it for free, um, is that uncertainty in computational estimates of reality uh, and the necessity for its quantification, that was a, uh, an important conclusion um, from, uh, from this report. So there's a couple of, um, a couple of terms I'm not really going to talk about. Um, so verification uh, is one of the things that this report addresses. Uh, which is about uh, how good is the computational implementation. Um, there's validation, which is about how accurately the model represents reality. Um, and then there's uncertainty quantification, which I am going to talk about. Um, and that's about how all of the different sources of error um, and uncertainty, how they feed into uncertainties uh, in a model prediction. Um, but if you're interested in this area, then I'd, I'd recommend that you um, you have a look at this document. I think it's quite a thorough uh, report that uh, addresses a lot of the background um, to this problem. So for the rest of the talk, uh, I'm going to focus on cardiac cellular electrophysiology models, um, describe our experience uh, based around emulators, um, which are also known as surrogate models or meta models. Um, and I'll explain exactly what that means um, in a moment. Um, and I want to scope out some important directions for future research. Um, now, I've got a, a, a screenshot of a, a website here called muckham.ac.uk, um, which is a, a resource that was produced by a fairly long-term um, project that, was, uh, that finished a few years ago but was based um, mainly in Sheffield. Um, and the background of the project was to look at complex models, um, particularly climate models um, and uh, other, other complex models. Models of galaxy formation were part of this as well. Um, and as part of this uh, activity, they produce a very good mathematical toolkit um, which um, describes uh, the techniques, the mathematics underlying the techniques I'm going to talk about um, in a lot of detail. Unfortunately, it is currently <coughs> unavailable um, but we're working very hard to get it up again as some security issue to do with part of the, the, um, uh, the website. Um, but it's still quite a useful resource uh, for reports, papers, presentations and all of that sort of thing. So, oops, wrong button again. Um, so, what are the kind of things that we would really like to do? Um, well, if we have a model, and I'm going to be talking about cardiac cellular electrophysiology models, um, we'd like to answer some of these questions. So for sensitivity analysis, uh, we'd like to have a better idea of how model parameters or inputs, how they influence outputs, which are the ones that we really care about uh, measuring precisely. Um, and then, uh, given some uncertainty in our model inputs, uh, how does that affect variance in the outputs? And uh, that means that we can also uh, address questions uh, like the, the final bullet point here. So if we have some experimental data, um, can we go backwards uh, through, uh, through our analysis to go from uncertain experimental measurements uh, to an estimate of um, what the model inputs or model parameters uh, that are consistent with those observations are? So these are some of the questions that I'm going to talk about um, in a moment. So first of all, uh, what is a model? Um, well, um, in terms of a mathematical or computational model, we always have some kind of inputs to our model, whether they're parameters or initial conditions uh, or boundary conditions or <coughs> even numerical uh, parameters. We take those inputs uh, and we turn them into outputs of some sort. Okay? So we've got a vector of inputs uh, which are typically re referred to as x, and we've got a vector of outputs typically referred to as y. Um, and our cardiac cell model, because that's what I'm going to be talking about, uh, we can actually write that down uh, as um, a simple equation, so y equals f of x. Uh, and this is a hyphen, not a minus sign, just in case anybody's <laughs> confused. Um, OK, so we, we turn our inputs uh, into outputs. Um, and generally, we've got a for a cardiac cell model, we've got a system of ODEs um, that we will use to do that. Um, if we wanted to replace that model um, with something else, uh, 
um, then uh, we could do that actually. Um, if we replace our function f with a different function that produces uh, approximately the same outputs for a given set of for a given set of inputs, um, then we've got an equivalent uh, equivalent function. Um, and uh, in the area that I've got involved in, this is often referred to as an emulator, but sometimes referred to as a surrogate model or a meta model. But essentially, when I'm talking about an emulator, all I'm doing is replacing the computational model with something else that produces the same output for a given set of inputs. Now we can do this in a number of different ways um, and uh, one approach which has been uh, used um, is to replace the model here uh, with a set of um, polynomials which are then fitted to a set of uh, training data to produce um, a function which is capable of producing outputs as a function of inputs that are uh, equivalent to um, the original model. Um, I'm not going to be talking about uh, this approach. Uh, I'm going to be talking about a statistical uh, model called a Gaussian process, uh, which will sit here. And again, it will take inputs and produce outputs. Um, so what is a Gaussian process? Uh, well, it's a statistical model uh, which has been used in um, machine learning particularly. Uh, in computer science. Um, it's uh, a distribution over functions. So um, in the same way as you might draw samples from a normal distribution, uh, with a Gaussian process you draw samples, or you draw functions from the Gaussian process. Um, and here uh, what I've done is to draw some sample outputs. I think there are 10 there. Um, and what these are doing are um, they're giving us one output as a function uh, of one, one input. Now the Gaussian process has a number of parameters um, and what we can do, and I'll show you this in a moment, um, is to set those parameters so that the outputs that we get or the, um, the distribution uh, of outputs that we get uh, is trained or constrained uh, to fit some input-output relationship. Um, but just to give you a flavor for what these um, parameters do, um, the parameter delta is a length scale. Um, and if we, um, if, we change, uh, if we change delta, um, so we reduce it, then we get a shorter length scale. We get much more wiggly outputs when we draw them uh, from the Gaussian process. Uh, the other parameter, sigma squared, um, describes how far the um, the functions that we get from our Gaussian process uh, deviate from the mean. So here we've specified a mean to be zero um, and uh, sigma squared is one. Um, so that's, that's a raw and an untrained uh, Gaussian process. Um, so say we have some, some data points. So these are um, outputs as a function <coughs> of these uh, five different values of our input. Um, we can fit the Gaussian process so that the parameters uh, are, um, are tuned uh, to constrain the functions that we can draw. Uh, and when we've gone through that process, um, the, the functions that we draw pass exactly through our training points. And what we've got here is an uncertain input-output relationship. Okay, we've drawn our 10, our 10 samples here. Uh, we've constrained them to pass through the, um, uh, the training points. Um, and by doing that, we've reduced the uncertainty of the function here, but we've still got quite a lot of uncertainty here. Now, all of this takes place in a, a Bayesian environment, so we can update uh, our Gaussian process with new data points. Um, so we've fitted uh, our parameters using design data. And what we're doing here, because this is, this is Bayesian, we're, we're establishing the maximum likelihood of the parameters given our five data points. Okay? Um, and, and that means that we can estimate, we can use this, uh, this trained Gaussian process to estimate the output um, for any values of the input given the design data. And if we estimate the output 
Uh, here, we're going to get quite a precise estimate with a, s a small amount of uncertainty. Uh, but if we try to estimate the output here, we're going to get a lot of uh, uncertainty. OK, so uh, we're going to do that here. So here are our 10 estimates for uh, what the output might be when the input is 0.25. Now, what we can do if we want to reduce that uncertainty, because we've got quite a lot of uncertainty here, um, is to add in uh, a couple of extra observations. We can update the parameters, um, and then we can reduce the uncertainty. Uh, so now, if we were to estimate um, what our output is for an input of 0.25, it will be a much, um, it will, the variability will be much lower. So. Uh, another way of plotting the output is instead of taking our 10 samples, um, is to plot uh, a mean and a confidence interval uh, of the output. Uh, and that's what I've done here. So the green, uh, sorry, the blue um, is uh, the mean or the expectation of the output. Uh, and the green uh, lines show uh, the variance of the output. Um, so what we've done is we've taken some design data here. Um, uh, and essentially, what we've done is a curve fitting exercise. Okay? We've tuned our Gaussian process so that it can reproduce um, a, uh, the input output relationship. Um, but it does so in a very honest way, unlike other interpolation techniques, because it tells you when it's uncertain about the fit. Okay? Um, because as well as getting the mean, you get a variance out of the other end. So um, a bit more about what it is um, in detail. Um, I've already said it's a distribution over functions, um, and it's got these parameters or hyperparameters to distinguish them from the model parameters um, that can be fitted to uh, a set of inputs and outputs. Um, once we've fitted it, um, we can estimate the output uh, for any input vector, so any new set of data. Um, we can estimate the output. Um, and when we do that, we get an expectation and a variance. So we get the mean um, of the output, what we'd expect, um, and also how certain the Gaussian process is about it. Um, underlying this technique, there are no real assumptions except that our model, f of x, uh, is reasonably smooth, doesn't have any discontinuities. Um, I'll, I'll emphasize this point in a little while, but evaluating the emulator, um, so evaluating f prime, uh, is very fast, and maybe much faster than evaluating the model, the original model. And that means that we can really thoroughly explore the input space. Um, and any of our inputs can be specified as uncertain. So when we evaluate the emulator to get the expected output uh, and its variance, um, we can assign uh, a mean value and a variance to any of our inputs. Um, another very helpful thing is that if we, we make the assumption that our inputs and outputs are normally distributed, um, then uh, that means that we can actually calculate uh, the distributions on the outputs directly without having to evaluate the uh, Gaussian process at all. Um, and we can use that to estimate a sensitivity index, which is um, uh, an index of how much an output changes per input. Um, and we can do that uh, using this approach by assigning some variance to each of our inputs, measuring the variance on the outputs, and then the sensitivity index is the proportion of the output variance that is accounted for by a particular input. Okay, so if a particular input is very important, has a high sensitivity index, <coughs> then almost all of the output variance will be accounted for by variance in the input. So lots of applications for this type of approach. Um, I've already said that Gaussian processes uh, were developed for the by the machine learning community to learn from data. Um, and they've also been used to study a range of computer models. So these are some of the other areas where these techniques have been used. 
um, particularly galaxy formation, which is a very computationally intensive model, uh, where models take months to run on very big computers. So what have we done? Um, so uh, we did an initial study looking at the Luo-Rudi 1991 model, um, mainly because uh, it's got a small number of uh, ion channel currents. Uh, it's fairly quick to compute anyway, um, but we've got a, also got a fairly good feel uh, for how it worked. We selected uh, as our input to the Gaussian processes um, the, the maximum conductances of the six ion channel uh, currents, and we also selected eight outputs, which are all metrics of the action potential shape. Uh, they're listed here, so we've got um, APD at 50% repolarization, APD at 90% repolarization, the maximum DVDT, uh, the um, action potential uh, maximum voltage, uh, dome voltage, and resting voltage. Um, we, we built a separate emulator for each of these outputs. Um, I've tried to avoid too much technical language, but each of these GPs had a, 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 me, a linear mean function and an exponential uh, covariance. Um, we fitted our hyperparameters uh, using a set of design data, which I'll show you in a moment. And we also validated, or eval sorry, I should say evaluated, not validated. Um, we evaluated each of our Gaussian processes using an additional set of simulator runs. Uh, so that's model runs where we compared the output of the Luo-Rudi model with the predicted output of the um, Gaussian process to see if it was uh, well fitted. Um, so these are what our design data looked like. So we ran the Luo-Rudi model 200 times. Um, we used Latin hypercube sampling on each of our inputs. So we assigned uh, a, a, a variability to each of our inputs. You might not be able to see these, uh, but these are our ion channel conductances along the bottom. Um, and these are the different action potential metrics uh, in rows. Um, and these two <coughs> graphs here, uh, each, each point is a different evaluation of the lua rudi model. Um, these graphs here, this is the uh, maximum DVDT, um, and this is the sodium conductance, uh, and this is the uh, maximum voltage. Um, and there's very tight correlation there, which is exactly what we'd expect. And I'll come back to that uh, shortly. Um, some of these other input-output relationships have got, uh, appear to be um, telling us something. So here this is um, uh, GK1 and the resting voltage. And again, we'd expect that kind of uh, relationship there. Um, so I, the, the next thing we did was apparently something that a lot of people who are experimenting with this approach uh, will do, um, which is to compare uh, what type of output we got from the Gaussian process uh, with Monte Carlo uh, simulation, which I guess you might be more familiar with. Um, what we did here uh, was to hold all of our inputs constant, uh, except for um, the potassium conductance, uh, which we um, assigned a variance to. So we made this input uncertain. And these graphs here um, show the distribution uh, of uh, action potential duration as we increase the variance of the potassium conductance. OK, so the blue line here uh, shows a fairly tight distribution when the potassium uh, conductance has a small variance. Uh, and then the yellow one shows a more variability in APD uh, for a larger variance of the potassium conductance. So this set of uh, distributions here was calculated with the Gaussian process. Um, and this set of, of uh, distributions here was uh, calculated using a, a standard Monte Carlo approach where we drew um, samples for GK from a normal distribution and then calculated APD in the same way. Um, and the important difference is that this Gaussian process was calibrated using 220 uh, evaluations of the cardiac cell model. Um, each of these uh, distributions here represents 2,000 evaluations uh, for the Monte Carlo um, analysis, so 8,000 simulator runs uh, in total. Um, and I'm really showing you this to, to, to demonstrate that this kind of approach uh, can avoid 
uh, really heavyweight Monte Carlo calculations because uh, we get um, a, a very good representation of these distributions. Um, and the thing that really blew me away for this was the quantitative agreement between the distributions, actually. It gave me a lot of confidence that our implementation of the Gaussian process code was correct. Um, so it's a lot faster to evaluate, uh, and I'll come back to another way we can exploit that uh, right at the end uh, of the talk. So I also talked about sensitivity indices, um, and what we've got here is a grid of sensitivity indices uh, for each of our outputs, which are listed down here, uh, and each of our inputs uh, along here. Um, so these are um, the proportion of the total output variance that is accounted for by variance uh, on each of these inputs. Um, and again, it was uh, good to see that we were getting very large sensitivity indices uh, describing the effect of the sodium channel maximum conductance on maximum DVDT uh, and maximum voltage. Exactly what we'd expect, um, and it's there. Um, the other thing uh, which is not showing on this uh, graph here, but you'll see shortly, um, is each of these is the proportion of the output variance that's accounted for, for by variance on the inputs. Um, now, if we sum these along each row, um, they should come up to, uh, to one. Um, if they don't, that tells us that there's some variance has gone missing somewhere. Okay? And these are first order uh, effects, so only taking account of each input on its own. Um, in the case where the, the sum across a row of these uh, sensitivity indices is less than one, that tells us there could be some second order effects going on, or maybe our Gaussian process isn't very well fitted. So, um, just to emphasize, uh, we've the relationships. So here I've shown you again, these are the design data that we use to train the Gaussian process. Here are our sensitivity indices. Uh, here are the sodium channel effects that I talked about before. Um, and I also mentioned that there was a relationship between um, resting voltage uh, and GK1. And again, that shows up as quite a high sensitivity index. So this approach can tell us quite a bit about how a cell model is working. Sorry, Richard, before I'm just jumping back, so what, can you just go over that, that point about summing to one and perhaps use the example of the minimum diastolic interval more in the bottom row there? Yeah, it's that's a, so it's a long way from one. Um, so that tells us that the, um, well, either there's a lot of interaction effects going on between the parameters, um, or, and I think this is the case uh, in this example, actually, that the emulator wasn't very well fitted. Um, we'll actually see the sums in a few slides time for the, the, the CRN model. Um, so having, having had a go with the Lua Rudy uh, 1991 model, we've looked at a more detailed um, cardiac cell model, um, which uh, has got uh, nine uh, ion channel maximal conductances, um, free pump exchange at maxima. Uh, we also added in some external boundary conditions, um, so the cell capacitance and the extracellular concentration uh, of sodium, uh, potassium, and calcium. Um, and uh, we took these uh, as in the inputs. We haven't yet looked at calcium um, handling, but uh, that's uh, obviously going to be something that's going to be worth looking at. Um, I'm not sure that that final bullet point is correct for this talk because I borrowed this slide from another talk. Um, so uh, ignore the bit about hidden parameters. So we took as our inputs um, the, uh, the ion channel conductances, pump exchange and maxima, uh, and external boundary conditions. The outputs uh, were pretty much the same. Um, and the aim uh, was to capture as many of the action potential features as we could uh, to allow it to be <coughs> reconstructed. Um, for our design data, um, we ran the model uh, a thousand times because we've got more inputs to take account of than for the Lua Rudy model. Um, and these are the final two action potentials um, in a 40 action potential series that we um, used. Um, and I've superimposed all of the action potentials. Um, and the ones that I've highlighted in blue uh, are um, situations where there's some spontaneous activity going on. So we've pushed the model outside of its normal stable uh, 
uh, operating um, point. Um, you won't make a lot of sense of this. Again, we've got our inputs along the bottom, outputs along the top. Uh, again, this is uh, maximum dV dt and uh, voltage amplitude, um, and this is sodium conductance. So that's a bit of a sanity check. But everything else is a, is, is a bit more messy in terms of the input-output relationships. Um, so I haven't shown one of these plots before. Um, one of the other things we can do with a Gaussian process emulator is to calculate um, the output uh, as uh, each input varies across, um, uh, across a range. Um, so I've done this here, um, and the output here is APD90. Um, um, each of these lines represents what the APD, um, what the mean of the estimate of APD is uh, when one of these parameters is changed and all of the others are held constant. Okay, so we can see that when we're looking at the um, variance-based sensitivity analysis, we're kind of focusing in right at the middle here. Um, what we're not necessarily taking into account is what might happen as some of these uh, inputs um, change quite a lot. They can have a more disproportionate effect on the output. So here are our sensitivity indices again. Um, I've done the sum this time, uh, so you can see that uh, in this case, um, most of our sensitivity indices sum to close to one. Um, and uh, again, uh, we've got a nice high sensitivity of um, uh, maximum <coughs> DVDT and voltage action potential amplitude to sodium conductance. Um, but everything else is a bit more diffuse. So, okay, that's, that's quite interesting, but what else can we do? Well, we can compare uh, the sensitivity indices for two different models. Um, and that's what I've done here. We've got the Cortemange ramirez natel model here, um, and this is the graph that I've just showed you. Um, and then underneath is the same um, arrangement of inputs, of outputs and inputs, uh, for a different cardiac cell model with a different, or uh, slightly different bunch of equations. Um, and we can see that actually there are some quite big differences between these models. Um, so we can use this sensitivity indices, as, as I mentioned before, to begin to dig into uh, the models and how the inputs and the outputs are related. So just to finish, um, I want to talk a little bit about history matching, which is very much uh, a work in progress. Um, and it's, it's a technique which has been um, used quite a lot in the <coughs> models of galaxy formation to try to identify what the model parameters um, or what the, the likely values of model parameters are that are consistent with experimental observations. Um, so the idea, uh, and there's a bit, a bit more detail on the slide, but the basic idea is you run the Gaussian process a lot of times and you really thoroughly explore your input space. Um, and what you're trying to do is to identify regions of input space that are not consistent with experimental observations. So when you pick that point in input space and evaluate your model, the output is so far from the observation that you can be pretty confident that that region of input space is implausible. Okay, and we get into slightly complicated semantics here. Um, but uh, if you can rule out areas of input space, then uh, you should be able to, well, you can identify uh, a range or region of input space that is consistent with a particular set uh, of experimental data. Um, and what we've done here, um, and uh, there's, there's quite a lot of detail on this slide, um, is, is history matching to look at uh, the cellular changes that underlie chronic atrial fibrillation. Um, so we've taken three particular observations on exp of ex included in experimental data, so action potential duration, uh, resting voltage, and action potential amplitude. Um, and these experimental data come as a, an estimate with a um, an error bar. Um, 
and we can take that error into account and calculate um, an implausibility measure, which is a, a really it's a measure of how far the um, the emulator prediction is from uh, the experimental observation. Um, we can run our emulator a lot of times. Um, so on this graph, we've actually got 18,900,000 model evaluations here. Um, each of these plots uh, plots one input against another, so each is a pair of inputs. Um, and the colors uh, encode the implausibility. Uh, so the red regions are regions of input space. And remember, these are just little projections of a uh, high dimensional input space. These are regions uh, that are inconsistent with the experimental observations. Um, so using uh, this approach, the aim is to be able to identify um, what the parameter changes are, so how the ion channel parameters change uh, as um, a cell moves from being in a normal healthy heart to a heart that's undergoing chronic AF. So I'm going to finish at this point. Um, so I just want to finish off by trying to summarize where I've been. Um, first point I want to, to just re-emphasize is that um, models are not reality. And if we're thinking about using models in a clinical setting, um, we need to be very careful about how we explain this because people might say, well, your model's no good if it's not the same as reality. Um, I think we probably know better than that, but um, we just need to think about it, I, I think, and be aware of it. Um, there's a lot of places. I haven't really talked much about where uncertainty comes from, but I've listed some of the sources here. Um, okay, so think back to the, uh, the diagram that I showed at the beginning with all the model parameters for the ventricular cell models, uh, different colors, uh, different species, different temperatures, and so on. Um, so there's experimental error. So uh, <coughs> there's all these kinds of um, <coughs> things that can influence uh, an experiment. There's natural variability. Um, we, uh, if we're building an anatomical model, then there's a whole bunch of uh, uncertainties that can come from the imaging physics, uh, from segmentation, uh, from meshing. Okay, as we're getting from a stack of MR images to, uh, to a mesh that we can run computations on, there's a lot of different stages uh, of uncertainty uh, that can build up. Uh, in the numerics, um, there are always approximations uh, that can build up. Um, we might also just not know stuff uh, about our model. So there's a, a whole bunch of uncertainty to do with things we don't know. Um, and also model discrepancy, which is a, a term that statisticians use to describe um, how a model is different to reality. So it kind of embed, might embed the assumptions and simplifications that we make um, in the modeling process. So once we start thinking about it, there are a lot of reasons why um, our, our models might be different from reality. Um, there's more extended discussion uh, in a paper that we published recently. Um, and I think we, as modelers, we should be accounting for uncertainty a bit more carefully um, than we are. This will enable us to, uh, to use models more effectively. Um, and there's a lot of other communities, uh, climate forecasting in particular, um, are doing this already. Uh, so one of the things about climate models uh, predicting how the temperature uh, of the Earth will change or might change um, in the future, uh, they are doing a lot of work to try and quantify the uncertainty in the different parts of the model. Um, and the reason for doing that is to try and figure out what they need to measure more precisely to make the predictions better, because there's a lot of divergence in the predictions of global temperature. Um, there's a lot of tools. I've talked about one particular uh, approach to, to doing this kind of stuff uh, using Gaussian processes. Um, there are other approaches as well. Uh, I talked about um, polynomial chaos uh, already. Monte Carlo is another tried and tested technique uh, as well. Um, it's not really clear what approaches might work best, best for us. So there's, there's a lot of interesting things to do. Um, and um, it's, if, if you're starting out in your career, uh, I think understanding these kind of issues 
is, well, it's written down, interesting, topical, difficult and crucial. So I think it's an important area to, um, uh, to be thinking about and it will, might be a good thing to, uh, to pick as a research interest. Um, finally, if you want to have a go with some of the stuff that I've been talking about, um, we have a, um, an implementation of all of this stuff in Python, uh, which is free to download um, from, uh, from GitHub. Um, and if you don't want to scribble this down, I can, I'm quite happy to, uh, to give you the link to that. A um, few people I need to thank. Uh, this work's been funded by the Engineering and Physical Sciences Research Council in the UK. Um, there's uh, a bunch of uh, statisticians in Sheffield um, and elsewhere who've been really helpful in explaining uh, some of this stuff to me because it's not something that I, I still wouldn't claim I understand it uh, in detail. Uh, Sam Coveney and Eugene Chang are uh, postdocs uh, who've been doing this work um, and uh, Gary Myrams, Pras Pathmanathan and Rick Gray and Steve Nidra have also been involved in this work as well. So thank you for listening and I'll try and answer any questions. So thanks Richard, and, and it's certainly a very important area that we all need to do a, a better job of in engineering. I'm, I'm going to jump in with the first quick question, and really what, uh, present company accepted, but what do you think, can you speculate a little bit about the sort of appetite for this sort of stuff in our clinical, with our clinical colleagues? And you know, how, how can we make this easy for them to digest and really make use of in a clinical context? Because like I say, present company accepted. Hmm. Lots of our clinical colleagues want to bring it down to one number, and this idea yep. of uncertainty around that number is something they may have some trouble getting to grips with. Have you thought about that? Yeah, and um, so there's Julian Gunn is a clinician in Sheffield who I've done a bit of work with. His particular interest is in um, virtual FFR, so that's fractional flow reserve in a coronary artery, and um, whether we can use um, computational fluid dynamics to predict that. Um, and that's quite an interesting one because it's very much a threshold, okay? And uh, depending on where the measurement is relative to the threshold, you either stent, put a stent in or you don't. Um, and uh, so and he's very receptive to the idea of a, an in silico technique that produces a number and a confidence interval. Because if the, number, if the confidence interval is really small and the number's close to the threshold, that's okay. If the confidence interval is huge, then he's going to, he's going to use other means to make his clinical decision. Um, and I think, I think clinicians are fairly receptive to the idea that, okay, this might not be, this might be a rubbish prediction. Um, I guess it goes back to communicating carefully <laughs> uh, so that they don't think, oh, the model's always rubbish, we're never going to use that. Um, so there needs to be a conversation there, but I think um, I think clinicians do work with uncertainty, whether they acknowledge it or not. Um, so, Thanks. yeah. Chris. Um, so, extra potential duration is obviously pretty sensitive to things like pacing cycle length and yep. S1, S2. Have you looked at varying those parameters at all? Does this method cope with that? Or? It, it would do, and I haven't. Um, uh, the, that would just be another input. Um, will be pacing cycle length. We decided not to do that at this stage because I just wanted to probe the model in one kind of uh, dynamic place. But um, but yeah, it would it would it would do that. The problem you might have with uh, particularly varying parameters, and this is something that we've encountered a little bit, is that if you allow the parameters or the inputs to vary a lot, uh, then you can push the model into all kinds of um, interesting states, so it starts beating by itself, or it doesn't repolarize, um, or you get alternands, in which, in which case you, you um, the Gaussian process would still work uh, with alternands, but you'd probably need to fit two Gaussian processes, one to the top end of the alternands curve and one to the bottom. But, but yeah, all, all these things are possible. All right, Bruce, Peter, Torbrasar. <laughs> <laughs> So my question is really just a, a kind of an extension of that. I mean, the, it seems to me that, you know, in terms of arrhythmia, we're mm -hmm. focusing on metrics like APD, et cetera, is not actually what you want to get out. It's the, it's the rate dependence of sodium channel resetting, which is kind of determines yep. everything. Can you, can you find, do you think, a single, you know, is there, is there likely to be a, a, a better subset of measures which will focus directly down the line of the things which really are important, for instance, with... Um, 
with those. And I, and I note the the original work on comparisons, rate dependence really shows up these, mm -hmm. you know, the quality of models uh, markedly, it seems mm. to me. I mean, this, this technique would work, will work with any model that's got inputs and outputs. Mm. So if you, can, if you can supply your Gaussian process with a, a, a vector of inputs and a vector of outputs, yeah. then, or, or so matrix of inputs. Yeah. Criteria and work yeah, exactly. Good. I mean, we're, we're looking at extending this to tissue models as yeah. well, where again, you've got inputs and well, outputs. That, that just, um, and the, problems the, problems the, I guess. Mm -hmm. the other thing, I mean, the, um, how sensitive is it to uh, the input data being actually uniformly distributed anyway? I mean, presumably, if <laughs> central limit theorem applies. It? Yeah, um, I mean that's that's an interesting question actually about the you know how you should choose your your design data, your in, your your training data, um, and how you should sample your input space. Um, I mean we've done Latin hypercube because it. It, it, it means that you're covering the input space reasonably evenly. Um, but if you talk to statisticians, some statisticians will suck on their teeth when you talk about Latin hypercube and talk about all of the different other different techniques you can use. Others will say, well, it works. <laughs> um, so I think you know, we're, there's, a, there's a lot of things which could be done to refine um, the, the design data. Um, and it, the history matching that I was talking about in, at the end, I mean, you can use that iteratively to kind of narrow down the particular space that you're in, interested in um, so that you can get a very good representation of uh, so you can get very, very good coverage of that particular region of input space. Because, um, you know, once you've, once you've got a lot of inputs, then actually the, the density of your design data in input space drops off dramatically. Um, so, but, yeah. Maybe my question relates to that. I, I just missed the, the bit about how you choose the points where you tie down the Gaussian process mm -hmm. of your input output relationship. Mm -hmm. How do you choose the number and the location of that and how much does the sensitivity index then depend on that choice? Yeah, so, um, so the number of design points um, is a so how many model evaluations you need for your training data, um, that is an active area of research. There are some rules of thumb. Um, and one rule of thumb is that you should have about 10 times as many uh, points as you have got inputs. Um, we found that didn't work for the atrial cell models, which is why we went up to about 1,000 points. Um, and um, I mean, the, 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 the kind of... One, one heuristic is just to keep increasing the number of points until you re think you've got reasonably well-trained emulators. Um, and uh, so that's, that's about choosing the number of, of design points. Um, choosing the range, um, we, uh, as a starting point, uh, went from um, 0.5 to 1.5 times the, the default value. Um, and uh, did a little bit of fine-tuning just to reduce the number of um, model evaluations where you had things like a failure to repolarize or spontaneous activity. Um, again, it, it kind of depends on the question you're asking, really, is how big, uh, what, what range you should choose for your inputs. Um, I mean, we could, have, we, could have, we could have had a bigger range, but I, uh, because you're sensitivity index evaluation is taking place at the kind of central point. Well, that's what we've been doing. We could, we could move it around. Um, we have done a little bit, and it doesn't make a big difference to the numbers that you get. Um, so more to do in that space anyway. That, 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 there's loads to do, I think. Yeah. Just so I'm, again, on the same kind of vein and mm. thread, um, there's an assumption here about smoothness of, the, of your parameters. And so there is. How I, I imagine that probably varies depending on the model about whether or not you yeah. have smooth topology and whether hmm. you can then do this subsampling with hmm. the surrogate um, because that's what you're doing here. Yeah. You generate yeah. a subsample and um, whether or not that's a reasonable approximation for. I mean, I've not I've not tried it out, but if you, if you were to have a discontinuity, then. My understanding is that the, the Gaussian process it would do it, it do it would do its best to kind of smooth off 
Now, what it would do if your discontinuity was a bit more like that, I'm not sure. And that's where you might want to have one Gaussian process for up here and one for down here. Um, but uh, yeah, I think these are all things to, to explore. Um, is, is there a way of also looking at the, the cross correlation between the parameters that come through? Because yeah. some of these parameters are going to be interlinked. Right? Yeah. So, yeah. so is, is there a nice way of teasing that out of your models? Because you have these matrices where you can yeah. kind of see which ones are important. Yep. Um, and they sum up to one. Yeah. Comparing in, in amongst those different parameters where you might see it gets also to Bruce's point. Are, are there some a few key parameters that you really want to nail. And, mm. you know, if you're going to measure a couple of things in the clinic, these, mm. these two combined are going to give you the best, mm -hmm. best prediction. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, so, so what I've shown you is the first order sensitivity indices, um, but you can, you can also calculate second and third order, which are the, the sensitivities to um, combined changes in, in, in more than one parameter. Um, again, not something we've done, but it's, and actually our software does it, which uh, Sam Coveney wrote, wrote the software and he built that in. Uh, we just haven't used it yet. You could imagine methods like partial least squares regression, which kind of is a method that gets yeah. quite a bit here. Yeah. On top of that, yeah. you actually yeah. provide that information yeah. to see which are the most important combinations. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I'm just hoping if you could go back to your, the last sensitivity plot you showed. This one? Yeah, that one. So it seems some of those parameters are not resulting in almost any changes in the Yeah. Outcome. So does it mean that the, but these are still action potential. Yeah. So does it mean that the action potential itself is not uh, providing, well, it's not, uh, there might be other things that could be measured in order to get responses for those? Or is it, or, or is throw it, them away? <laughs> or throw them away. Yeah. But the question here is that that, that that show, it doesn't show a response in the action potential. It no. It show a response in something else mm. that's important. Yeah. Um, yeah, and the, exactly. That's showing, well, I mean, within, within the way this calculation is being done, so we've assigned a particular variance to the inputs. Keeping the others fixed? Um, well, we assign a particular variance to all of the inputs and then calculate the output variance and then how much each of these contributes to the output variance. Oh. So, so here, the sodium conductance is, is just is dominating everything, okay, except a little bit of capacitance in, in this model. Um, so, uh, so, so yeah, I mean, it's saying that some of these parameters, actually, um, the, uh, the extracellular uh, concentrations have a very marginal effect in, in the Malika model. Um, now, if we, obviously, if we multiplied these by 10, <laughs> we'd expect the model to break. Um, so, uh, so it's only looking at a variation um, around the normal value. But yes, it's certainly, it, what, it, what it does do is it enables you to identify, you know, at, in this part of the input space, what are the important parameters? So what, what would you want to nail? Um, Any questions from that side of the room? Um, you, you have looked at um, this kind of uh, emulation for a single cell, yep. but obviously cells influence each other. Yep. So the variability um, or the expected value you are computing, the variance you are computing uh, based on the parameters of one cell and uh, another cell, have you studied this interaction? Nope, not yet, but, but we're beginning to look at tissue models. Um, uh, where well, we've got a different set of inputs and outputs, um, and uh, but that's that's the logical thing to do is to look at, uh, and I guess you could treat another uh, another cell as another input. Am I right in thinking they look like gap junctions? Yes, in in tissue, yeah, yeah. So a resistive connection. Final final question. Yeah. Okay. So I've just been brought back. I'm computing mathematics graduate. I've never looked into biological modelling in depth. Why is it that we can't simulate a cell right down to the molecular level with Schrodinger equations? Just too much. I'd love to use it as an understanding of the underlying physics, not up to it. Well, I think it's getting from, getting from the, the underlying physics to um, a few hundred microns. Mm. <laughs>
Um, so, I mean, uh, but uh, but there's, uh, uh, yeah, I mean, I'm not really sure what the kind of the bottom end of cell computations. Um, you know, I mean, we can certainly calculate calcium hand or model calcium handling to a reasonable degree of uh, of realism and um, mitochondria and all of that kind of stuff, but not really further than that. All right, well, it just remains to thank Richard for a fantastic talk. I should say he was here completely on holiday, and I found out about it, so I said he needs to visit the ABI on a Tuesday afternoon. <laughs> and I whisked him into this room. So thanks so much, Richard, for giving us a great talk. Oh,